Innan vi drar igång avsnittet en disclaimer. Det här avsnittet gjordes med en blankar profil som blankar aktier. Alltså tjänar han pengar när de här aktierna går dåligt. Därför finns det ett egen intresse från hans sida av att prata dåligt om de här aktierna. Och i avsnittet så kommer han med uppgifter om bedrägeri och annat. Det är ingenting varken jag har möjlighet eller kunskapen att bekräfta eller dementera varken i avsnittet eller nu i efterhand. Så som alltid, gör din egen research, bilda din egen uppfattning och med de orden så kör vi avsnittet. Dagens gäst rör upp känslor. En blankad profil som står bakom Visroy Research, kända i Sverige för blankningen av SBB. Vilket är ett av ämnena, men vi kommer också att prata om de andra casen. Hexatronic, Hexagon och lite True Color. Han pratar inte svenska, så intervjun görs på engelska. Med de orden säger vi warm welcome, Fraser Purring. Thank you for having me. <laughs> All right. Uh, Fraser, uh, let's start with... Um, that you ha- you have stirred up some emotions uh, people have uh, opinions about you and you are um i would say quite an active communicator on twitter and such but for people that don't know you can you give us like the background from you, for you who you are who is fraser purring um basically i've been short selling i think somewhere in the region of nearly 10 years now um we we look at it very differently to analysts on the market and it's our, our main focus is irregularities malfeasance and um trades contrary to everyone else in a sector and we like to think about things very differently to a conventional investor which is a deep dive generally into the workings of what the company are doing um it's what every investor should do long or short and i think part of the reason we're so successful is we try and keep it very simple and when we don't keep it simple um we're going to lose money but we also have high conviction so we aren't in it anything we publish we aren't in it for three minutes or one day you know for sbb i think we've been short off and on now since the date of publication is that nearly two years now something yeah. like that yeah i mean uh so if if you were to, if you were to summarize if you were to summarize viceroy we're a high conviction short selling outfit that focuses on the finer details that often analysts or investors overlook and this can cause a pricing mismatch between reality and hope i mean in in short you are uh, exclusively on the short side of investing uh, would that be fair or do you have any long positions we do do longs from time to time um we we've been involved in a couple of longs but we don't publish on them we've done very well on them but the the focus for viceroy we don't peop- want people confused by <laughs> how is it a long or short report and <laughs> i know they wouldn't be confused for long just by reading it but we enjoy the shorts it's it's highly addictive so i'm just trying to go back to like when this started would it be fair to say it really started for you with wirecard in 2016 or do you have an earlier story or anything like that oh we we were going all the way back to quintus in australia in 2015 um that went to bankruptcy we, the it, it went bankrupt i think the day after we published and the, the we we've also been involved prior to 2015 but we didn't really have a brand if that makes sense we weren't publishing as viceroy and we we mainly we focused on disseminating information to journalists and other people where um they they could make their mind up they the same with any journalist and i think this is important to raise it um So basically, uh, I didn't know about you even after Wirecard and those things. I knew about you, as I suspect most Swedes know about you, from SBB. 
if you would say, like normally short sellers, in my view, they post the report and there's like back and forth. It felt like you had a beef directly with the owner and CEO, Ilya Batlian, and it was a very dramatic trade. Would you agree to that description? And uh, how was the SBB trade? The SBB trade was what really successful. We've had more success since, but uh, SBB was very successful. There was no beef with Ilya Batlan at all from my end. Um, he made it personal. He called us criminals. Um, he acted entirely irrationally, and I'm going to highlight that. And uh, oh, obviously, we have a a sense of humour, so we we would highlight some of his wrongdoings. Um, but we kept it specifically commercial. We published nothing personal about them. And Ilya would jump on any conspiracy about Viceroy, even down to reposting that I think we'd been involved with sabotaging or sinking submarines. I mean, he, uh, the, the man, as far as I'm concerned, he shouldn't be allowed as a director of any company. And he, he goes around and... He 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 was responsible for the sinking of SBB, and with SBB, the, the 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 relevance was had he taken the action he should have done earlier, investors wouldn't have been this far underwater, and he continued with a dividend parade, and it was only a parade. Um, where he even went, I think it was to monthly dividends. And the the rational element of running a business was detached from the reality. He was solely focused on the share price. And that could be because he's an investor, but he was acting completely. It, it was almost like he was reading um, Reddit or wherever and then doing exactly what they said. But uh, if I... Had to eat. But uh, wait for a minute. I mean, SBB trade really went your way. But to be honest, uh, even though SBB is like the prime examples, there were a lot of real estate companies in Sweden who suffered a lot in the stock market when the interest rates were hiking up. Do you think your SBB trade would have worked e if the interest rate didn't hike so fast and by so much in Sweden? Um, S SBB, in our view, was one of the most aggressive in its valuations. We found evidence, I think it was in report number two. Um, we'd covered it in report number one, but not in great detail, where, excuse me, they'd actually um, purchased property and it had escalated in value on their books by nearly 100%, almost in a day. I'm sure it wasn't, but if it was, that's nuts. But it was within, within a few weeks of acquiring property, they, it, they would recognise on a, 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 on a valuation basis of the rent they could achieve and um, put that on their balance sheet at significant multiples. And real estate is about risk and reward and leverage. And SBB, no matter what the interest rates were doing, they they obviously helped our thesis. But the reality was they just fast forwarded it a little bit. The, 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 the management style at SBB, whether it is now, but people seem to be leaving on health grounds, um, the 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 management style was one of a dictator where he, he was even alluding and this is how batshit crazy it got but, okay um, in, it just uh, i think it was yeah. one moment see uh, if i um, if we take it from the other side then uh, some will say that your report about spb even though you got right in the end that you had some factual errors in the report. How do you respond to that? Well, without knowing which they were referring to, I couldn't tell you. But remember, it's our view. And the, 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 the leverage element of no one can deny that SBB, even in lower rates, was extremely leveraged. And that's what I was just coming to about 
how bizarre it was. This was a man that was asserted at one stage in 2019, I think it was, or 2020, that it should be on a multiple, multiple or valuation of tech. And the, the, the level of disconnect between SBB and reality, no matter which way you cut it, and you've seen that with some of the prudence in other real estate in Sweden, where they've raised capital, they, they, it, whether the dividends are going to be totally nullified for until there's a recovery on the cards is another matter. But they've taken action, maybe too late. I'm not going to praise other companies that I'm not referring. I'm speaking generally. And essentially speaking, SBB was saying everything that was in complete denial of the facts. If you are highly leveraged and you're paying an insane level of dividend, but SBB, they were driven into the ground by a board's compliance with their leader. And I say that because no, no one was actually uh, appeared to be putting some conservatism to it. And whether you criticise there were errors or not in the report, you can't ignore the fact it was highly levered. They didn't recognise all the debt. You know, some debt wasn't debt. It was recognised as equity. And the analysts out there, and I know some of them will be listening to this, they're a complete disgrace. One of them emailed in to us saying, let's have a, a live debate. And the debate was this, whether what we classed as debt was debt versus what they didn't class as debt. Uh, well, and uh, here's Fraser. I, I one don't thing know that, what it is. Yeah, one thing that strikes me when you talk about SBB and uh, actually any case is that uh, you use phrases like batshit crazy um, and I know on Twitter you used the word fraud but it's not uh, on this one, it's for hexagon and other things. Do you think your aggressive way of communication sometimes hamper your trustworthiness? If you want the eloquence, yeah, we can talk about eloquence, but why does why does the very fact of someone acting irrationally and batshit crazy and literally on those levels where they they appear in complete denial, why 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 are you going to get into whether the the politeness is um, they're acting irrationally. They were destroying shareholder value. Hexagon committed fraud. And should, should we start going, there's an irregularity. If you want analyst research, come buy it. The odds are that you will lose money on it. And, and the, the reality is we say it is as it is. And... It's about time the market, per se, and analysts woke up. Instead of being spoon-fed, and that's where your softness and skill in the word, the logic of why you should buy SBB. Um, when we came out, how many reports came out? We see no risk to it. Yeah? Let them eat their own words. Those realities of the softness, we spoke to management and with our model. They didn't go and buy the local documents at one euro and realise some of these SPVs were well underwater when they got going. And that's a simple part of short selling. If you don't like it, no, I'm not encouraging you to short selling. Here's a thought for you on virtually every single report. If you're an investor, instead of attacking us, and buying more, if you actually read it and made your own mind up and thought there's too much risk here and sold, the odds are you would have saved in your investment value something between 45 and 89%. Or would you prefer us to go, there's a few issues here that the, the company need to explain. Companies are not generally honest when they're exposed. Okay, but, uh, remember if, that. Yeah, all right. Or they. Start I mean, fair point. Fair point. If you, uh, I mean, the short seller can be on your side if they they can save you from losing more money if they are actually right and it is fraudulent or if um, there's a downside risk. But 
going back to SBB, um, there's also this element that this stock and actually the other stocks that you've uh, shorted here, like uh, Hexatronic or Hexagon, a lot of them are owned a large share by retail investors in Sweden. Is that a common thread that you look for companies with a lot of small investors or? I, is it not it's owned by dividend hunters, shall we say, people that are looking for income, passive income stocks? And there are good companies out there that have reduced their dividend in the current cycle. And it's unfortunate in a way that the, the retail element believe management more than the, the hedge fund society, if you want to call it a society. And as such, they actually get to a point where they just believe management. They don't acknowledge any macro issues. They ignore certain elements and they get brought up in a herd. And here's a thought for you. Um, there was in the Nordics and Sweden in particular, when GME and AMC were going off, those meme stocks, and there was a short squeeze and they were, uh, what was it called? Mother of all short squeezes. Yeah. And they got involved in that. They didn't look at the underlying value of the business. And I don't take a list each Monday and look in Sweden and go, OK, where are the retailers invested? It just happens that retailer are prepared or retailer prepared to believe management either quicker or for longer than the professional investor that goes, hang on, guys, this is looking real toppy. Whereas... But investors to, in the retail segment. I mean, to be fair, so let's look at, for example, Hexagon. So first you publish a report. Say I'm a retail investor. I'm reading through it. It's a lot of pages. It's a lot of things. Then Hexagon responds 16 pages. And I have to go through all that. Then you respond to Hexagon response. And I have to read through it. I mean, the sheer amount that a retail investor has to go through to make up their mind, uh, doesn't that, can you see like from their point of view, it's very difficult to understand what's truthful or not? It's not okay, but it's our opinion, more importantly. And for an investor, if you're saying it's a lot to go through, a lot of these have, uh, I was shocked, I spoke, and we speak of the, the, the impact of what management do that we expose. I spoke to an SBB investor that, I spoke to many actually, but this one sort of hit home for me. They believed the management and they lost off memory, and I'll need to check, but I'm sure it was 90% of their savings coming up to retirement. They thought that it was an attack, as you've rightly mentioned, on a Swedish company with a high retail segment. And really? It's just the fact the management have overpromised, and it's to the moon. And they can't accept this level, but there's an important lesson here. If you're getting such contentious or differing stories. There is another trade which Sweden and Norway and various other com countries, including Germany, need to accept. And that's one called, there is such a trade as not shorting and not longing, just moving away from. And they, 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 that is another trade. Ash is a real trade for us. If we aren't invested in companies or shorting them, do you know what we stick to? Cash. Because it's king. It presents opportunity. And you don't have to. Well, you, if you look objectively at how people are, you can say we're overly aggressive. But yeah. let's go back to Hexagon. We published a report which clearly showed that they had undisclosed related party transactions, which they tried to trade, change with, change the history of, even though the facts speak for themselves. And they were front-running via their Greenbridge entity, which was undisclosed. 
And they'd done it previously and said they would clean their act up. So there's tick box number one. Number two, you have Hexagon, right, where they assert growth is consistently good and we're going to split it out and all the buzzwords. But the reality is when you go and buy the local documents, and most of them are free, remember that. You suddenly see a massive declines in revenues of some of the companies they bought, and it's gone to shit. But according to their goodwill and how they measure it, on on whatever level the management want to assess, so CGU, cash generating unit. So again, when something's failing, back it into another division to keep the goodwill there. But they responded. And here's a thought for you. So they might be right on share price in the short term. But Hexagon responded to us with two seconds. Someone was trying to phone. Uh, Hexagon responded with a statement. And at the bottom, it had the most bizarre disclaimer that it might not be true and they can't be held liable and nor give any warranties to what they've said. Now, you're saying, Fraser, disclaimers, you use one on your website. Yeah, because we're giving an opinion. But is the company giving an opinion or should it be giving fact? I don't know who Ola Rollin is trying to kid. He's still running the show. But what the hell is that disclaimer for? The first sentence, not about the future and forward-looking statements. Give them their dues, put the disclaimer in, because that could change. But they were disclaiming all their past disclosures, which it, they can't give warranty to and it, it can't be used against them. But uh, to go back to like, simply, what's the substance on Hexagon, like, the main thing here is you accuse them of uh, not having the revenue growth as they claim the organic growth is not that great. It's acquired growth at a high price. Um, yeah. I mean, do you, when you say that they're fraudulent, do you mean that they are falsifying the numbers by itself? I mean, growth is growth. Is, is that money non-existent or how do you mean here's, they falsify it? Here's a thought for you. So the growth was totally inconsistent with what they've acquired. They conveniently don't break out every acquisition because some of them are, are immaterial. Let's give them that. But they are so acquisition hungry that the materiality is in the sums of that greatness of acquisition. And when you start looking around in the weeds, all of a sudden you find companies that have gone insolvent. They don't buy companies out of insolvency. No, they buy the assets. And then it still behaves badly. And then you've got how, how is it? And here's a challenge for everyone listening to this. Let's go down uh, the conspiratorial route. How is it that Hexagon has only written down 8.5 million euros of goodwill in 20 years, 23 or something. How is it? Now, the goodwill is something you can't see or touch, but it implies a valuation on your business and it implies how well it's doing. But they seem to have tripped on to a fact or tripped, sorry, not tripped. And you could argue that it's legal. I think it's disingenuous and it misrepresents the full quality or that lack thereof of the business by not reporting 80 odd companies, uh, the revenues have declined. How is that? But growth every year goes up. And you'll say, well, Fraser, there's a logical argument that the sums of the parts have grown more than what's declined. No, we can prove it. We actually put out examples. Wait, so, wait, wait. so you're saying that they haven't written down the goodwill. That's where a lot of those companies that haven't performed well have a blown up value. And you think that the revenue they are reporting is factually wrong. Is it correct to understand the, the, that? 
It, the revenue split no way represented the lack of growth. If you add it up from when they acquired the revenue, or the company, should I say, and then they recognized the revenue, the growth cycle was clearly misrepresented by the numbers. Clearly. See, but I'm, I'm assuming now, if I ask them, they would say, no, the revenue we have shown is the revenue. We haven't falsified this. I mean, do you have any... And to be honest, the burden of evidence is on you. What do you have tangible that the, this money doesn't exist? This revenue, in my view, should be... I mean, oh, there should be say. a lack of cash flow in that, in that sense. Where's the evidence? Look in the books. One we've mentioned, Goodwill. Let's go on to cash flow. Yes. This company has issued debt year on year, and the cash flow is absolutely dire. Break it out. So what evidence do you have? Oh, well, it's only a few declining business is. That's represented by the cash flow. Then they're doing cost cutting. And they have um, entities all over the world that you buy the books on for a euro. Do it yourself, I say. And then go away and say, what tangible evidence do you have that businesses that they bought have gone to the wall? And it's there in black and white. You're saying the burden of proof is on me. The burden is on Hexagon. Publish every single lot of books which I mean, wait, 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 no, 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 wait, let, let me clarify it. The burden of evidence to show that their business is functional, it's on them. But when you say it's fraudulent, then if it is fraudulent or not, then that burden of proof is on you. We evidence that burden of proof. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, 100%. We evidenced our opinion. We, we backed up our opinion with company accounts which contradicted the growth profile of Hexagon. What more do you want? If, no. if those businesses, and this, you, you, it's good that you raise this. How much do, do the retailers, if you want to, because you focused and said it's owned significantly by a retail element in Sweden. But let's forget that. How much evidence does everyone need before they actually start to question their long thesis, why they bought it? And the reality is people have been able to go over and buy the accounts. And some of those investors have sold shares because they replicated our work. They didn't trust us, which is a good start. Don't trust anyone in a game. And there's nothing up with being objective going away. And how many people have come to the same conclusion but analysts that hope to do work with Hexagon in the future, putting out price targets of 130, 140? Now, the denial is that. That's the that's logic. They've got a business to run, like we have. But you can go away and replicate our work and make up your own mind. And it's not that difficult. It's just labor. Wait, wait, wait. It, it is. It is a bit but difficult. It takes some. It takes some work. It takes some work. It, it's. It's a. It's a lot because it's one thing to read your report, then you have to read the response, and then you have to read your report, and then you have to go into the report and uh, do a digging for yourself. So, I would disagree that it's easy. It's. It's actually quite extensive work uh, for. I mean, a normal person. I mean, you work with this. I don't. I. I don't spend my time on three, four. But when you yeah. when you go, hang on a minute. But that's that's my job. I find it yeah. easy, and uh, it is easy to replicate because you can go away and check facts. And uh, then when you start finding that they've bought assets out of insolvency, and they're using phrases like "we didn't buy companies out of insolvency," they, they factually bought assets. We have auditors' reports to prove that. <laughs> But then you get on to the response. So we, we put forward our evidence and we haven't finished there yet. So remember that. Super spännande podd och här kommer lite reklam men spolen förbi för det här kan vara din chans att bli private banking kund hos Nordnet. Ja, egentligen har det inte så mycket att göra med chans, men det du behöver göra är att samla 2,5 miljoner kronor 
i samlat kapital hos oss på Nordnet. Här ingår tjänstepension, så det är lättare om du till exempel flyttar tjänstepensionen till Nordnet ihop med lite andra sparande. Och varför ska du göra detta? Jo, för att det är massa fördelar av att vara private banking-kund kostar inget extra. Så låt oss gå igenom tre fördelar med att vara private banking-kund på Nordnet. Nummer ett, förmånliga rabatter och villkor för kortage och utlåningsräntor. Även specialränta på ISK kapitalförsäkring. Utöver detta har vi ett jättebra sparkonto. Här kan du ha dina pengar och få bra ränta medan du funderar på vilken aktie eller fond du ska köpa härnäst. Dessutom fria och snabba uttag. Nummer två, snabb service. Du kommer få ett eget nummer till vårt mäklar- och serviceteam. Och där kommer du kunna ställa frågor om pension, specifika investeringsmöjligheter eller andra börsfrågor. Och målet är att vi ska kunna svara dig inom 30 sekunder. Otroligt va? Nummer tre, hjälp i orderläggning. Behöver du hjälp att köpa och sälja stora poster via algoritmer, dark pools eller blocks, då kan vi hjälpa dig. Och det här är en service normalt bara professionella och institutionella investerare har. Men vi ger detta till alla våra private banking-kunder som vill. Vill du bli private banking-kund, gå in på norden.se-pb för att anmäla intresse. Sen kommer någon i vårt private banking-team att ringa upp dig för att hjälpa dig med det praktiska. Kom ihåg att finansiella instrument kan både öka och minska i värde. Det är ingen garanti att du får tillbaka dina pengar du investerat. Och vi har nämnt sparkonto och investeringssparkonto. Självklart har båda statlig insättningsgaranti här på Nordnet. Tillbaks i podden! Can, can we change to uh, another stock that you've uh, traded that we've gotten a lot of questions from? Uh, this is from uh, you've uh, shorted Hexatronic, and that trade has also gone quite in your way. Uh, Hexatronic has been down for a while now, uh, quite significantly. From uh, a cash point point of view, it was a weak Q1, improved in Q2. And then it was uh, more dire in Q3. Um, what's your view on Hexatronic? Uh, were you nervous when the Q2 reports the, came the, out? The, the, the... No, it's a roll-up business. When the cash flow doesn't meet what they're saying it does. And we got a lot of criticism because we didn't publish. Uh, We were going to, and then we weren't. We were short it, and we don't have to publish. I'm short three stocks in Sweden at the moment. I haven't published on any of them. And the the reality is that Hexatronic was a roll-up where they were giving companies they purchased large orders prior to purchase. Now, why the hell would you do that? Because it would only inflate the value. And they were in this living hell of a, a inflationary costs, the significant levels of capex required, and the market didn't acknowledge it. So yeah, we 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 put out our opinion, and we spoke to journalists from France, Germany, Sweden, Norway, and the, if we're short to stock. There's a, when there's a massive disconnect, um, it needs highlighting. And that's the same with Exotronic, where the cash flow didn't stack up. Acquisitions, you know, heavily or aggressively acquiring companies, both of them, Hexagon and Hexatronic. People say I was confused between Hexatronic and Hexagon. <laughs> no, they're just... Overvalued. They're just overvalued businesses. There's there's no confusion between the two. I mean, wasn't didn't Exotronic only have their first management call like last quarter in how many years? Uh, I mean, what level of disrespect are you giving investors? But wait, 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 uh, lying wait, to wait, them. let's go back to Exotronic. Like your criticism of Hexatronic and the disconnect between its previous market price and the risk they had, uh, was it solely on the basis of expensive acquisitions? No, the cash flow as well. Cash flow didn't stack up. But because in Q2, and the cash flow was quite good. for me came at significant. It was the, you don't look for, or you should look, Sorry, you don't look at just one measure. You look at measures across years. 
when you're shorting a company. And there's general themes. And one Philip of um, a company doing well for one quarter won't change your thesis. It's a good opportunity to add to your short. And picking out various times when a company did well, every single company we've shorted has done well at some point. And if your thesis is, oh, no, and that's a good quarter and cover, no, add to it. But the, the criticism is, and it's good that you ask it like that, analysts, investors and whatnot look at it and we are generally positive thinking. We like to see the good in people. And when people point out the bad bits of what other people are seeing as good, all of a sudden they become emotionally invested. And I've never seen it, anything like that, as in Sweden, where if they own the stock, they're actually married to it, including the analysts, more than their wives. <laughs> and it, I, it, it's a shame I've got it in front of me. I, I'll read you out um, about someone that was long hexatronic and SBB. And he, he alluded to when he acknowledged he was wrong, and he didn't lose money. But when he acknowledged he was wrong, he suddenly realized he had more emotionally invested in the stock market than he did his own wife. And he knew that because she left and said, why don't you just marry the beep beep NASDAQ? They're back together now. We, we, we have good dialogue and banter. But the, the reality is that people get so emotionally invested and it's very good you raise the question. What evidence do you have? We published it. Make your own mind up. If you don't believe us and you're invested, Buy more, stay as you are, do nothing. If you believe us and you think there's very good questions that need answering, then either reduce, sell, do nothing. You, It's not us that control what you do. I, I'd love to finish, finish up with uh, a short and segment I, I call true or false. So I'm going to say some statements. You're going to say true, false, and you may see a sentence or two about each. So, are you prepared? Here we okay. go. When there's yeah. arguing... Oh, Jesus, here we go. <laughs> yeah. When there's arguing and name calling between you and a CEO of companies you short, you're not bothered by it at all. In fact, you thrive on it. Yes. <laughs> True. The, uh, uh, matter of fact, uh, and I'll explain why. If they keep it to business and prove otherwise, we'd move on. But when they degenerate to that, I, I, I'm up for a bit of banter. I call it banter myself. They, 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 they might call it name calling. I, I think from memory, the, the back chats with most of the Swedish CEOs, the conversations behind the phone, um, a really interesting about Viceroy, Ilya Batalan specifically, was so incensed by the conspiracy. He was putting out that we were working with companies, we were criminals, we'd lost our case in South Africa, that we've actually won. It got thrown out. Oh, all right, it's right. going on again, but we'll win that as well. But let's go but to the next one then, uh, because I've got and, a few of these. Uh, you've had great success in Sweden, but now you're no longer an underdog because of your success. And you really like being the underdog. I think we still are the underdog. I think a short seller will always be the underdog. And it, it, the, the beauty of it is that you, you're coming, the amount of work that goes into our opinion is unbelievable. And we, do you know, we actually assume we're wrong for most of the research we do on a company. So never assume you're a top dog because you'll fall to your knees very quickly. Uh, the next one, you don't say it out loud, but you get a kick when a lot of people are wrong and losing money while you were right. I, I, I actually say it out loud that I, there's certain people out there that are so vehement that they get karma. I, I, legitimately, as we spoke about earlier, 
there is a trade such as cash. You don't have to have a dog in a fight. And uh, essentially speaking, the denials that you get from certain people, and I take I take great pleasure in watching someone pray. Um, they dig up anything from your past, whether true or accurate, true, accurate, false, you name it. And I take great pleasure, particularly there were certain people on SBB that their vitriol was low life. And I will bask in their karma like anyone would. And I know that's not a Swedish way, but we, we can't afford to be wrong. But we can acknowledge we're wrong. And that's an important thing. It came up on your thread about asking questions. Yeah. What was our worst trade? AMD. The, inf the information was right. We got the perspective or perception that the market would care completely wrong. They didn't give a toss. And, yeah, we got it wrong. We acknowledged that the, the market didn't give a hoot. But you move on. And if you're emotion, and it comes back to the emotions, I'm sure to stock. I've got no emotion in that. But don't come and abuse me on a daily basis and threaten to kill me. On SBB, I think I had 128 death threats on day one. I've learned to say it in Swedish, actually. Oh, right. <laughs> it became that common. Hey, wait, wait, wait. Prove it. Is, Prove it. What's, what's the name of it? Say again. What's the name of it in Swedish? <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my friend, no, my, uh, I, I am not feeding an army of people saying that my pronunciation is really bad. That is why we called SBB harder to pronounce. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going there. <laughs> final one, final one for you. If you didn't do what you do, you'd be an investigative journalist. Yes. On the simple measure, we do the same test. We might write it very differently. We use punchier headlines. Um, but the reality is we have our, our level of evidence in SBB, in Hexagon, in what we didn't publish on Hexatronic, but we did the work, is all the same. We have to have a good threshold. And we've, we've looked at companies in Sweden. They're actually quite good. And we haven't invested in them, but their metrics for how they were valued, we thought was off. And we've done a lot of work. And now we can't be right. We can't be right. And then we were proven that we can't be right because again, the underlying company is good. Uh, final question. And uh, this is a company you haven't talked about, but previously you... Uh, accused them of a lot of things. Uh, true caller, what happened there? Do you still stand by your claims? Yeah, very much so. It's going to get a lot worse. Are you short? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and very much so. True caller have been completely disingenuous with how the business model was structured. Um, a lot more people are looking at it. True Caller isn't a Swedish company. It's an Indian company. And it's using a, a system in which it avoids its liabilities, in my view, in India, to re recognize them in Sweden. So it's almost like an exporter. But the reality is, I think it's 79 or 89% of their business is done in India. Um, no matter what their transfer pricing arrangements are, it's an Indian business. And it got some benefits when it IPO'd to market. And there's been some more recent news out as well, which we come to expect in February, March, because we got a lot on our plate. But I would urge anyone to start Googling True Caller and the actions taken in India. Is various things from prosecutions that are ongoing, new laws that we haven't finished there, but we've got, we're a small team. We got a lot on our plate and we enjoy that plate. We don't mind it at all, but we, we can't be everywhere. We haven't got 80 positions. 
And the reason why we don't have 80 positions is I don't think you can manage what the news coming in is about. Fair enough, and fair enough. Uh, uh, final, final question, because I know we have run out of time. So this one I've gotten from a lot of people. Uh, so I have to raise this. Um, you give sometimes information about the report of a stock to certain media outlets, uh, knowing that these reports have an effect on the market price. Um, could that not be a bit unethical? You give some certain people early access. Uh, why don't you just publish the report and the media can take it up afterwards? Which news agency doesn't work Dog, like that? I mean, uh, you gave Dog is in the street. <laughs> It's an accepted fact that you'll be sharing work. The amount of, I can even show you companies on the long side, which makes up 90% of the news, are sharing information with journalists. It's an accepted industry standard. The journalists have to get comfortable with your work. But why do you do it? Do you do it because others do it? Or do you do it because you want the media to write about it before you publish it? So it comes out all at the same time and it makes a shocking effect. I'm trying to think of a company that I've actually had written about where we're short before an event. I don't think there is one. And I can't guarantee, I wish I could. If that's the argument and the criticism, let's go through, let's go these men through this mental gymnastics. That, that people are trying to attribute. So if we allegedly share, which we do, but we, we allegedly share everything with journalists pre-event so that when we come out, they can publish. I don't think it's ever happened and it's not guaranteed. If it was, do you really think I would only have so much, so little news coverage? You, you can go across every single name. And if that was the case where um, the media and I are in coach, the media aren't honoring their side of the No, no, wait, 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 wait. There can be an argument that the, the same people asking this have an argument that the media were not doing what's ethically right or how, however you say it. But uh, now I'm questioning you, like, wouldn't it be more fair that, you know, we've done the report of Hexatronic, we publish it. I know that company you haven't published, but uh, anyway, at three o'clock and whoever wants to write about it can write about it. No one gets pre-access to our report. But that's no different to analysts saying that they've got across the news as of today, I expect if you use the term within news and media agencies, analysts say, yeah, and they've given advanced views on stories that are coming out. But are you saying if if if, if the assertion or the, the, the this jump in logic is that everyone should be the, all the information that we use is public, and if it wasn't, doing pre-access would be questionable. But the, all the information that we have ever published on has been public. You could have found it. So is there a difference? Do they publish ev on everything that we tweet about or publish? No. Some of it the days after. But what's the issue? All right, Fraser. I mean, uh, this has been a ride to, uh, uh, to speak to you. I mean, we've talked so much about so many topics. And I've been on edge to like balance things out the whole interview, uh, which is a good challenge for me. So I really thank you for being here with us and also good luck with your trade. And maybe one day you will also have some long cases in Sweden and be on the other side, but uh, we'll only have to see. Thank you very much yeah. and goodbye, Fraser. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.